First Person this week focuses on the legacy of Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia and the looming battle shaping up to replace him. We've invited two people to help us sort through that. Professor Alan Garfield is from the Widener University Delaware Law School and from the University of Delaware we have Dr. Eric Rise. He's the Associate Chairman of the Sociology and Justice Department. Gentlemen, thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, Professor Garfield, let's start with you and the Scalia legacy. There's been a lot of praise for his ability to bring forward the notion of original intent. And is that really his legacy? Uh, that is a big part of his legacy that, you know, the whole question in interpreting the Constitution is with the with constitutional law is why can a small group of people overrule laws elected by uh, enacted by elected representatives? And because the Constitution's terms are so vague and so Scalia said we're back bound to interpret it by the original meaning of the Constitution and that he pushed that and and in, in some ways that put liberals on the spot for things like same-sex marriage and gay rights but of course there were lots of things like Citizens United and Bush versus Gore which he voted in favor of and didn't seem to comport with original meaning. Is one of those uh, sort of his most notable opinion or is there something else that you would say is sort of the defining Scalia opinion? Well, the opinion everybody points to is the Second Amendment opinion about the right to bear, that there was a private right to bear arms, which was a decision where he really did focus on the original meeting. But just to show how history could be manipulated, he went and looked at all the books and all the histories. So did Justice Stevens, and guess what? The five conservative justices read history to say there's a private right, right to bear arms. The four conservatives said history says there isn't. So. All right, so Dr. Rise, now we have this sort of kind of a, an epic showdown uh, in Congress uh, but between the White House and there's lots of the Republican candidates saying, now's the time to wait before we, before we do uh, a nomination or an approval for, it, for a new justice. What's the precedent behind kind of, kind of that idea? Well, I think one of the things that uh, I find strange about that is that uh, if you look at what the Constitution says, it really wants to keep the selection of the justices and judges, federal judges in general out of the hands of the people. Uh, the branch of government that is most close to the people, the House of Representatives, is completely left out of the process. It's left to uh, the President and to uh, the Senate. And so to say that the people should have their say really doesn't comport with, ironically, uh, the original intent of the founders. So now we have uh, Senator Coons, who is on the, the committee that will be sort of considering whatever the nominee is. Uh, d does, does he have an opportunity to, to build some consensus, or do you sort of foresee this as being uh, kind of a shouting match that we've seen over the last really eight years, it, the way Congress has kind of acted. Yeah, I would be very surprised to see anybody build some sort of consensus on this. I think uh, what's interesting to watch is how this will play out. Will the, uh, will the Republicans in the Senate really hold to not even considering a nomination or will they allow the president to make a nomination? Uh, consider it and then most likely vote it down. I don't think that uh, Senator Coons, or, or to be fair to him, anybody is going to be able to really uh, breach the, or, or uh, repair this breach that's existed uh, since, uh, since at least 2014, but probably since President Obama was elected. We haven't really seen consensus on pretty much any other issues. Absolutely. This will not be the issue that breaks Absolutely. it. Uh, Absolutely. So, Professor, the other, I guess, Replacing a Supreme Court justice is a relatively rare thing, doesn't happen all that often. And now uh, there's, looking ahead to the future, there's the potential that whoever is in the White House next year could have another opportunity to replace with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, possibly leaving the court. Uh, thoughts on, on the way this plays out in light of, of maybe that possibility? Well, this just goes to show how important it is for people to participate in the election because who is going to become the next president could be make major changes that could affect the Supreme Court for years to go. I mean, right now you've got a court where there's five reliably conservative justices and four reliably liberal justices, with Kennedy sometimes swinging to the left on things like same-sex marriage. So if you take one of the conservative judges like Scalia 
and you replace them with another Ruth Bader Ginsburg, it can have tremendous consequences for things like Citizens United decisions, same-sex marriage decision, voter ID laws, you know, regulation of extreme, you know, partisan gerrymandering, church and state issues. So there's a, a lot at stake, and that's why, you know, I agree uh, it's going to be very likely to find a consensus candidate because people know how much is at stake uh, in this appointment. And obviously the, the, the nomination of a Supreme Court justice always seems to be a, a, a political, political hot potato just because, because of it, because it's rarity or because of the process, the way it's designed to, to replace that person. Well, I think part of it is that uh, the Supreme Court nominations are, or Supreme Court appointments are part of a president's uh, longest living legacy. The judge, this is served for life, and therefore uh, it's a way to have an impact on uh, the government and on the nation even after you've left office. And so it's high stakes for the president. And then certainly, at least since uh, the Bork nomination in 1987, the process itself has been uh, highly politicized as well. Yeah, and mind you, if it was a conservative justice leaving and there was a Republican president, you know, uh, so you're replacing one conservative with another, it wouldn't be such a, mm -hmm. a difficult issue. And especially with, with the power of the court potentially shifting, it just, you know, makes for a very tense uh, battle. And then finally, uh, one kind of case or one issue where Scalia's vote kind of swayed things one way or the other, and, and, and now that that is sort of up, up for question as to what the future of a similar case might be, come to mind? Well, you know, in some ways, oddly, he wasn't uh, writing a, lots of majority decisions because he tended to like to do his things the own way. He wasn't a great coalition builder, but his votes were critical on same-sex marriage. His vote was critical on Citizens United. You know, his vote was critical on church and state issues, and you could go on and on down the list. So this is a very important, you know, decision as to who's gonna, who he's going to replace. Right, and I think in terms of cases that are currently on the docket, two things that will uh, clearly be affected by his absence and uh, will uh, probably allow to stand uh, decisions that he would likely have voted to overturn would be in terms of the uh, rights of public unions, uh, which is a case coming out of California, as well as a, um, a case involving voting rights and, and whether or not, uh, and how to apportion um, voting rights. It'll be fascinating to watch, and I'm sure you both will be eagerly uh, watching the developments. Uh, we can't wait to see how it all plays out. Professor Alan Garfield uh, of the Widener University Delaware Law School and Dr. Eric Rise, Associate Chairman of the Sociology and Justice Department at the University of Delaware. Gentlemen, thank you both for being here on FIRST.